Living Adventurously is brought to you in partnership with Kamut, the route planning and navigation app that helps you make the most of your outdoor adventures. Whether you're cycling, hiking, running or bikepacking, Kamut's easy to use technology will get you out the door and exploring more of the great outdoors. You can see where I've been exploring by checking out the highlights of my journey on Kamut. Just follow the link in the show notes. My name is Alistair Humphreys. I set out on a bicycle journey around Yorkshire to speak to interesting, ordinary people who, in very different ways, are making an effort to live adventurously. I wanted to talk about what they do, about the barriers they've faced along the way, and to seek their perspective on some of the big questions that all of us encounter in our lives. Welcome to Living Adventurously. <laughs> I've written here, needs intro music. Um, okay, here we go. Um... <laughs> That'll do. My conversation with Louise that you're about to hear now was perhaps the most thought-provoking chat of my whole trip. We met early for breakfast at a hipster cafe because Louise had to get to work. But when she's not working in her spare time, she's a keen caver and climber. Now, I have a kind of hate-hate relationship with the thought of claustrophobic spaces, so I was intrigued to hear her perspective on wriggling through the darkness. I, I love asking people about worlds that overlap with mine but are also very different and Louise's open thoughtful vulnerable explanations of realizing that she was not living the life she wanted to lead and then summoning up the boldness to make a massive change well that part of the conversation gave me huge amounts of food for thought over the days and weeks ahead we, we met via Twitter originally, uh, and on there you say you're a climber and a caver. Mm -hmm. Which is more scary? I don't think either's scary. I you, do. You, if you're getting scared, you're probably doing it wrong or doing, taking too many risks There's, or, or, or not managing the risks well enough. As, like Caving, if you get it wrong, it can be really dangerous. Climbing is a broken leg. Um, but yeah, I, I don't find ever that, either that scary. Well, maybe I'm just used to it. Okay, so you're not doing it for the adrenaline? No, no. Um, I, I, well, I do the climbing because I enjoy it, because I like being out in the hills. And the caving um, is exploration, often. We're trying to find new cave and new, new things to, to, to find. So in your, in your caving, which you do quite near to here, near to Sheffield, yeah. have you been a proper explorer? Have you been in a group that's gone somewhere no one's ever been before? Um, possibly not. No one's ever been before, but no one's never been in the last several hundred years. We do a lot in wow. mines, um, and so 17th century mines, I think I found a hole the other day that I don't think anyone's probably been in for at least 100 years. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? Just not, well, within an hour of a massive city. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and how did you get into caving? Um, I was a climber before, I said, and then so driving around the Peak District, you'd see these kind of muddy people with harnesses with equipment that looked a bit like climbing, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll give that a go. And so I found my uh, the nearest club to me is the Technical Speological Group in Castleton. I went along and um, loved it, just uh, and just carried on doing it, and so I've been doing it a year and a bit now. Uh, do climbers and cavers like each other? Hmm. <clears throat> Interesting question. I, I do both. Um, there are other climbers in our club. Um, they don't tend to mix too well because climbers like to get up quite early and go out climbing and cavers don't care what time of the day it is and will drink until four in the morning because it's going to be dark anyway. So I might as well stay, uh, you know, have a lie in. What's the, what's the difference in mindset between someone who is a good caver and someone who's a good climber? Um, I think good cavers are kind of happy to suffer, but also are doing it for a different reason often. We're, we're doing it to explore, whereas a lot of climbers are just doing it because they like climbing, and, and that's fine. So it's, okay, so it's more of a, um, a bit more of a mission to yeah. caving and purpose, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, um, I, before I started caving, I, I didn't really build things or do things, and now I own a 
power drill and, and uh, you know, all of these things. So we, we do a lot more project work and making things, even if it's just a new hitch and a lid on a cave or something. Okay. So uh, you, you brushed off my question about um, it being scary. And I <laughs> strongly dispute that because just the thought now of being squidged under a cave, bending my head on one side to fit my ear through a gap gives me the shudders and climbing. I love it, but it terrifies me. So is this an example? Is it an, a case of perceived risk versus actual danger? Is that I, part of it? I think so. Um, I think caving, there's been very few people being killed. There's more, a lot more people killed climbing than there are caving. Um, the, the problem with caving is if you do have an accident, um, it is, um, it can, it's more likely to be fatal than, than climbing. Um, unfortunately, there was one in the Dales a few months ago. Um, but it's, we, we do everything we can to make it safe. So all the caves are bolted on resin bolts that can take like 40 kilonewtons. Um, you know, the, the, you've got two cow's tails to clip you on. You've got a descender on the back up if you're doing things like that. Um, two ascenders, three ascenders. To, to keep. So, so we, it's very rarely dangerous, and especially with modern weather forecasting and things like that, the, you don't get flooded in if, unless, you, unless you really ignore the weather forecast. You're kind of asking for it at that point. So it's a case of you're doing something very dangerous, but going about it in a way that makes it not dangerous. Uh, so I think we're doing something that could have high, high consequence, but the risk of that happening is very low. And when it does, we also have very good rescue services. You know, quite a few of the people I cave with are in cave rescue. Um, but you don't do it for the thrill of the consequence. I think because I think some climbers are. Yeah, certainly the, certainly the good climbing books. There's a, there's quite a degree of not not suicidal tendencies, but you're properly <laughs> just. I'm really going to yeah. push push the edge here. I think um, possibly a little bit, but it's not it's not the reason we're going out there. We're not going out there to do something dangerous. Um, partly because the consequences are so high if you do get it wrong that we tend to be quite safe. Um, you know. It, in your, so I had a friend I was climbing with a few weeks ago, a few months ago, who fell and broke his leg. Um, and Mountain Rescue were there within about 20 minutes. In a cave, you're, depending on where you are, it could be eight hours. So you don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> yes. So the reason that I've started doing these interviews is, is not actually because I'm trying to find out about climbing and adventure stuff. I've mm. spent most of my adult life kind of interest in that sort of world. What, what really interests me now is how these people's adventurous things transfer to, to real life. Um, so what, what does caving or climbing, that, that notion of perceived risk versus actual danger, what do, you, what do you think that would transfer into people in real life wanting to do something that seems scary and therefore don't commit to doing things? Does it teach you anything? Yeah, I think it teaches you how to kind of look at risk and, and things like that. So I, in business, I use the same methods, really. I, I look at um, what the consequence of, of doing a thing is versus the chance of doing it, rather than just looking at something and saying, oh, that's high risk. It's OK, well, it's like what you probably mean there is it's high consequence. So if it goes wrong, this might mean the end of the business. But how can we mitigate all of those risks? How can we... Um, what can we do that and what's the chance of it even happening in the first place? That's an interesting thing, looking at the difference between consequences and risks. That is interesting. Um, can you give me an example of something that from your, from your work life? Your... Um, okay, so, it, so I, I work for a bank and I write software. Um, and so if we decide to implement a new feature, we might spend three months building that feature. And that might be a lot of money and sort of development time and people and things like that. Um, and if no one was to use that feature, it wasn't wouldn't be profitable, obviously. Or you know, no one was to make use of it, it w we wouldn't make any money off of it. Um, so there's the, the there's the the risk of doing that, and the the consequence of is we'd lose uh, x hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, but in the you know the reality is that we we've done all the research to say yes, users want this feature. Um, yes, it's profitable. We we think that they'll pay x amount for it, and so um, we we. Um, yeah, we go about and do it, and it's quite a simple cost-benefit analysis. I love your ice-cold caving approach to life. <laughs> um, I met a while ago one of the guys who did, did the Thai cave rescue yes. um, uh, at a, a, a speaking event, 
and me being me, I was trying to say, oh, you're so amazing. This is brilliant. What an emotional thing. Ah. And he, I couldn't get anything out of him. So well, we did what we had to do, mm. risks and consequences, which is why I'd be a terrible cave rescuer. <laughs> um, one of the, I'm going to move away from caving now. One of the things that I've got really interested in in recent years is that people want to do this in their life. They want to be there in their life. They, they like the idea of so-and-so in their life, but they're in this different yeah. position. And I think that's often the reason people read adventure books or come to adventure talks. It's living vicariously. So you, you want to be there, but you're actually here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, so that's a really interesting aspect of, I think, trying to dare yourself to live a bit more adventurously. So we, we first, the first I uh, knew of you is when you got in touch with me on Twitter. And your Twitter bio says... Uh, Louise McMahon, climber, caver, photographer. That's all a bit boring because I hang around with those four people a lot. <laughs> Trans woman, she slash her. And that got me really interested in terms of you want, you're here in life, but you want to be there. So can you tell me a little bit about the, the process of f feeling frustrated and wanting to be in a different position? Um, or does, it, does that, I mean, does that apply in your situation? So, from? okay, I think I see what you're getting at. So, yeah, so I'm uh, trans. I transitioned three years ago now. Um, and, yeah, that was, I suppose, yeah, you're sort of right. It, there is a similar sort of thing in that um, it took me a while to work out that that was a thing for me. Um, and then I <laughs> I sort of jumped at it with two feet once I'd worked it out. Oh, did you? Uh, yeah. Not a caver's approach? No, uh, no. I. Um, it was a a thing that once you realize often with people that, that it's um okay yeah this is a thing i need to do and once i did that actually a lot of the mental health issues and things like that that i had just kind of disappeared which was quite nice once you committed to to action yeah yeah so how long did it take you to 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 figure out that there was this sort of thing in your life that wasn't right that you wanted to change was that was that a was that there all your life? I think so. Yeah, um, it's probably not something. It's not something I'd worked, I'd realised um, until I was about eighteen. But it's probably when I look back at it, it's been there since at least. Well, it's, it definitely has been there my whole life. But something that sort of manifests itself around like twelve, thirteen, around puberty is, is the same thing for most trans people. Is what seems to happen. Okay. Um, but you start changing at that age, and you start to realise that this something isn't right. Um, whereas, um, and then yeah, so. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, and as I say, around 18, I kind of worked it out. Probably with the help of other people I knew. Had, uh, I sort of had other friends that had sort of done, uh, sort of had found the similar thing, uh, strangely. Uh, and also um, around that time, you started to see various people in the media that were trans. You started to see a lot more of Kathleen Jenner and, and various people. Not that I think she's a very useful role model, but <laughs> she, uh, you know, it, uh, and you kind of, oh, okay, that maybe that's me, and maybe that's what the problem I have. And when you start thinking about it, you go, oh, okay, yeah, that, that is, you know. I think that's one of the difficult things that loads of us face, isn't it? Of of having this kind of sense of life should be this doesn't feel yeah. like how life yeah. should be i think loads of us feel that in our yeah. in our own different worlds and then so identifying that is a yeah. but really hard but, but important first step isn't it and then the next thing you do of what was there any specific action you did or moment or event that tipped you into thinking right i'm going to commit to making um, a big change yeah, I suppose I is there's the coming out process um, with all of that um, that I sort of I could I couldn't I found it really hard and I still find it kind of hard in a in a way to tell people which is why I just tend to be open about it and that's easier. So um, much easier way to lie. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, than hiding Gosh, things. It's taken me decades to realise yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, um, and then um, just kind of I wrote a letter and from for my mum because I just couldn't tell her um, and that was kind of that was probably the, the there's no going back from this point. Um, and after that, I just kind of decided to start doing that. But um, I wasn't, I didn't have a job at the time. So um, rather than having, rather than sort of, um, I thought, well, I may as well, while I'm looking for jobs, use the right name and the right pronouns and, and things on my CV. So I did, and that kind of just forced me to to transition properly. Um, well, not properly, it's not the right word, but um, you know, f fully, because it was it, it was easier in a way to then, to, rather than hiding. It's really interesting, isn't it, how we build things up in the head, we worry about this and we worry about this and we worry about this. 
and we built so many of the yeah. barriers are yeah. inside our own head, yeah. aren't they? Have you found the so the stuff you were worried about before? How many of those worries actually came to fruition? None <laughs> at all. Um, so I, what did your mum say when she read your letter? She she was fine. I mean, we all everyone cried and everything, but it was you know it wasn't a, a problem. It, it's it's so funny. So I, the first did people bring, I told did it bring you closer together. I think so. Yeah, yeah. The the first people I told was a, a bunch of friends that I I um, used to play games with online, um, and I um, we were all in the channel together. Um, and uh, there were some other people in there, and I, I didn't realise there was other people in, in that channel. And uh, I well, it took me ages to, to write this whole message to, to post them, and I, and I posted it. And the first person that replied was someone I, I didn't know, and I, I completely freaked out, deleted it, and then sort of went to my friend and said, "You, you told me that it was just us in there." Uh, and he was like, oh, "Okay." Uh, and so he made another channel for, for just the, our friends, and I posted it, and then they all just kind of went, "What? what okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> what was the, why are you freaking out?" <laughs> so, Oh, okay, and that, that kind of made me like, oh, okay, this is okay, yeah. Gosh, I, I find that the parallels of this is so fascinating with people who... I get emails all the time from people who are wanting to quit their job to start a business mm. or they're wanting to chain, sell their house, they can go and cycle to China yeah. and things, and they worry and they worry and they worry. And a lot of it is this, this notion that society expects one thing, they expect one direction. People like me are supposed to do this yeah. in my life, and they worry what people think. Or I don't know anyone else like this. I'm a weirdo. No one else will do this sort of thing. Um, but then the commitment comes, and it's like, ah. So, what what advice would you offer to someone who, in, in whatever sphere it is themselves, is wanting to try to be a bit bolder and live a bit more adventurously yeah. in their own way, but isn't doing it because blah blah blah. I suppose. Um is to, to move if you're someone that's sat there going oh but this might go wrong or this might go wrong or this might go wrong at the end of the day just just try it just do it you, you'll you'll make it work whatever that is um and if there's problems along the way then you'll find ways to fix them you know uh, i think that's that's kind of what i did to an extent were you thinking about this might go this might go wrong this might be bad this might go wrong or were you thinking this will be good, this will be great, this will be a weight off my shoulders. Were you thinking of the positives or did the, the worries? At the time, the worries. Okay. Um, That's probably natural, isn't it? Yeah, I think that is kind of human nature to an extent. We are kind of cautious creatures. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, yeah, I was thinking about the worries, but in reality, they've paled in comparison to the, the benefits. But you don't often see the, the other benefits until you don't realise what the other benefits are until after. And look back and go, okay, no, I am a lot happier now, or no, I'm, I can, I am doing the things I want to do now, and things like that. Okay, so you've, you've noticed sort of spin-off benefits that you hadn't anticipated, have you? Yeah, yeah. Such as? Well, yeah. So I was really depressed at the time, and that's kind of gone away. But also, I've just got to the point of now, I just kind of go, oh well, I did that, I can do this. You know, go like starting caving. I just kind of was like a thing I wanted to try doing, and so I did. Okay. Um, you know, and. It's kind of easy to just do those sorts of things. Do you think then it's helping you build a habit of boldness or not? Yes, uh, to an extent, probably. Um, or a, um, or a, a way to do things and not, not worry about the, the you know, not worrying about the consequences isn't the right way to put it, but like not worrying about the um, what might go wrong, what, you know, just or, or maybe just try it, you know. Yeah, I'm try my natural tendency is to be quite pessimistic and nervous yeah. in life, but I've spent about 20 years now trying to train myself to be more optimistic and to be more bold and try yeah. new things. And it's hard, but the good thing is because I've been doing now 20 years of this, I've built up this habit of and through experience of seeing oh, that wasn't as bad as I yeah. thought it was. Oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Or, oh, I'm more capable than I thought I was. And it's, it becomes, you get some good momentum. But yeah. It takes time, doesn't it? So do you feel now that you're, you're living a more authentic life? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'm How living as, feel? as me, not as some pretending to be something I'm not. Um, it's, it's, it's good. It, you know, it, it is one less thing to spend your life worrying about. And, and why spend your life worrying about those things when you can get rid of them if you can? Yeah. Oh, I think it's brilliant, really brilliant. Um, one of the things I'm doing on this trip, cycling around, trying to solve the meaning of life. 
and I've done that through a series <laughs> of questions and some playing cards. So I wondered if you would uh, sure. do me the favour of answering a few. So if you take mm -hmm. the card off the top, um, if ignore it if you don't want to answer it. Do you need to earn money or do what you want to, uh, to earn money? So is, uh, uh, so yeah, my terrible handwriting. So do you need to earn money or do you want to earn money? Oh, okay. So interested right. in your approach. This is sort of totally yes. changed topic now. This is um, money. Is it something that for you, you obviously need a bit, mm. but do you feel it's something you need or something you want? I need money to do the things that I want to do, but I don't mean I need money. I, I, I need you know some funds to do things, but I don't go chasing money just for the sake of money. Um, it's a tool to allow me to do other things. But my biggest problem isn't money, is time. Okay. You know, having a full-time job is, is good because you earn a decent wage often, um, but you don't have the time to do things. 20-something um, days holiday a year is, is not that much when you uh, want to do big trips or big expeditions or something like that. So, What would you do if I gave you a year of free time? Well, that's a really good question. I, if I had a year's free time, I would probably... Ooh, I don't know. I'd probably spend a lot more time exploring the UK. Um, there's so many more places to cave in the UK. I've not hardly done any of Scotland. I've done a bit in North Wales of, of walking and mountaineering. Um, I'd probably finish my mountain leader. <laughs> Keep meaning to do that. It's another I thing still I need to do. I haven't finished mine. No, <laughs> I think that's the perpetual thing. So many people have started and not finished those things. Um, but yes, I'd, I'd probably do that. Okay, cool. Uh, next sure. card. If you had an extra hour every day all to yourself, how would you spend it? Oh, so that's actually slightly different okay. to having a year off, isn't yeah. it? It's if you had one hour a day. Oh, that's a good question. I won't say something like I'd read a book or I'd uh, learn to do another skill. I'd probably use it to sleep because okay. um, <laughs> I don't get enough, it seems. Um, no, I, if I, if I, if, but if I purposely spent an hour doing something else a day, it would probably be reading more or... Um, or um, building things more. I don't spend enough time actually working on projects. I've, I'm perpetually starting projects and not finishing them. So, okay. um, I would, yes, I would probably try and do that more. I spent years, because I'm also desperately in search of more time mm. in life, and I always find sleep such a waste. Like, ah, I'm wasting it. So for years, I thought sleep was for wimps. Mm. But one thing I've done that's been really good was accepting that sleep is not for wimps. No. Sleep is for champions. Yeah. And now just making myself say, this is a non-negotiable chunk yeah. of time and it's a good investment. Yeah, definitely. I think I definitely notice if I don't get good sleep, I uh, get really grumpy and tired and can't do the things often. Yes. Well. Yeah. So, yeah cool. Next one. Yeah. Tell me about making the most out of life. Ooh. Making the most out of life. What do you mean by that? I think, I think one thing that really worries me a lot is the prospect of getting old right. and looking back and regretting having done a bit of a half-assed mm. job on it so how, how do you in, t in terms of just trying to live a life that feels mm. but i think it's more than being fun and exciting it's with some sort of purpose to it as yeah well. yeah i does that, does that sort of thing cross your mind? Yeah, it's something that I often perpetually get worried about in the middle of the night normally. <laughs> when you should <laughs> be sleeping. When I should be sleeping. It's, it's like, um, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to be 80 in a retirement home going, oh, I wish I'd done that. And that's often an excuse I use to, to do things, really, to try things because... Otherwise, I, I don't want to get to that point and go, oh, I wish I'd done that, I wish I'd done that, I wish I'd done that, and kind of not... Don't want to regret doing not doing things. So. Does, does that consciously prod you to action sometimes? I think so. If I look at something and go, I quite, I'd quite like to do that one day, I'll probably just go, oh, sod it, I'll just do it then. <laughs> um, and, you know, if, if you have funds to do things, it's quite easy to go and book things and, and, and try these things, you know. But uh, yes, not all of them happen. Yeah, of course not. Yeah. I suppose that's the con... You, you, you're saying you've got got a job you earn sufficient money but you don't have enough time the the flip side of that is being aware that yeah oh, i earn enough money therefore i might as well use it on yeah, something exactly yeah that feels important yeah. okay cool next one. a couple more uh, th this is a i'm conscious of the time because you unlike most people i speak to actually have a proper job <laughs> that you have to go to 
Uh, what? And not until 10 o'clock, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a proper job if you don't have to start until 10. <laughs> <laughs> but what does living adventurously mean to you? Has that definition changed with time? What did it mean to you as a child? Okay. I suppose as a child, it was riding around on my bike. I grew up in a little village in, in Nottinghamshire. Um, and so I was able to ride around on my bike and see my friends and, and do all those things. Um, as an adult, he's it, trying to do more stuff that I enjoy, really. I, I I don't see the stuff I do as adventures or expeditions or anything like that. I mean, some of them get called expeditions because that's what we call sort of caving stuff. Um, but um, I just see it as fun a lot of the time. They're just things I enjoy doing and I'm trying to fill my life with things I enjoy doing and th and less of the things I don't enjoy doing. Which is basically the same as riding around the village on your bike, seeing your friends. Isn't exactly, it? So yeah. Is it not, it hasn't particularly it's not changed. Really, it's not really changed, I okay. don't think, yeah. The things have changed, yeah. but the actual content, the, the re reasons for doing them hasn't. That's interesting, because I think that um, um, I spent years and years and years thinking adventure mm -hmm. has to be this, this, and this, so I must keep doing this, this, yeah. and this. But after 20 odd years of doing this, this, and this, I thought it's changing. Yeah. And it's taken me a long time to think, oh, I can still try and be bold and curious but in different ways yeah yeah all right we'll do do one more question and i'll send you off to work <laughs> someone's got to keep this co this economy running while i'm riding my bike <laughs> it's all right for some <laughs> i'll think of you in my morning meetings <laughs> why do you not act when you know what to do Ooh, okay there's Ooh. a big one to uh, to end N with not act so things that uh, the times when you know what to do. Yeah. This is what I want to do. My life would be better if da, 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 da. Why do you not get on and do that? Or is it, does that not feature as an issue uh, for you? I it, think it, it, it all comes lot. down to time, probably for me, probably time and, and the, the, the risk as well, if something's, you know, risk in, in whatever way that might mean. Um, but no, or, or at least me pretending I don't have enough time, which is probably often also a thing. Uh, I'm sure I do. I'm sure I could do more if I really focused on certain things but yeah, um, pretend, yeah that's a very good phrase pretending you don't have enough time is often just the excuse we use because yes. we're scared of x yeah. y and z isn't it i think so yeah yeah you you acknowledge that that sometimes you do that yeah i definitely do procrastinate uh, <laughs> you know i think but i think we all do and uh, but recognizing that is also quite important yeah it certainly is uh, Louise, thank you so much for talking no to me so uh, honestly and eloquently um i've really enjoyed it uh, but i do think Next time you have eggs, you should eat the green bits. <laughs> They're very good for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Living Adventurously. There's show notes from every episode on my website, alistairhumphreys.com slash podcast. If you have enjoyed it, please take a screenshot of your phone and pop it up on social media, or leave a review with your podcast provider. It makes a massive difference. Thank you very much. To make this podcast happen, I teamed up with Kamut, the outdoor planning and navigation app that helps you explore more of the great outdoors. One of the many ways Kamut helps you have better adventures is through their highlights feature. Kamut highlights are recommendations from local adventurers in the area you want to explore. They could be a great cafe, a particularly beautiful stretch of trail, a lookout point, or a well-stocked shop. These recommendations appear on the map as highlights, large red dots for popular highlights, those with lots of additional information and images, or small red dots for highlights that have fewer comments and images. Inside the hint, the size of the dot doesn't necessarily correspond to the quality of the highlight in real life. It only indicates how many people have visited the highlight before you. Perhaps it's a little less visited and therefore all the more special. Your very own outdoor experiences and some inspiring highlights are waiting for you. Go explore more with Kamut. Head to Kamut.com slash g and use the voucher code adventurous to claim your free region bundle